Hello everyone, I'm Marcelo. I'm here with Aaron so that we can talk with you about our experience on integrating contract on other subsystems. Uh, this is our uh, agenda for today. We're going to explain the motivation for this work, describe what we have done so far, some, some initial test results, really, really initial, future work that we are seeing, and then we have some time for question and answers. So motivations for contract. Uh, it's a really big DOS vector. Uh, if you have it in your network and if you are not prepared, it may get uh, filled by some attacker because it's layer three and it can be routed. It can, it is routable and some Entity outside of your network can just fill it and then new connections won't get through until other older ones expire. Um, but in spite of this, contracts is still important. It provides stateful forwarding uh, for VMs and small gateways. And one of the critical features of it is that it has what they, they call helpers, that they can track auxiliary connections for FTP, for example. So you can have the data connection getting through. Um, so we need it and we also need it offloaded because the lack of it is going to be hindering the open vSwitch offloading adoption. And we have information that major cloud providers are abandoning contract where they can because it cannot be offloaded and they need the speed, they need the performance. Um, OpenSec and other cloud technologies still needed. Uh, contract is how we do NAT. Uh, it has, it holds the entire table on which AP and which parts should be translated to what. It is the base functionality for security groups. So whenever you enable it on OpenSec, you are relying on contract. And there you can see already that in this case, you cannot offload that OpenStack load because it requires a uh, contract. And also node ports also use it. So what we did, to, in order to offload contract, you first have to have the software data path done because that's how you control it. Uh, you cannot control the hardware directly and assume that the software data path isn't there. So we must integrate first in the software data path, and that's what we did as I step towards offloading. And so on this talk, it's all software for now, but with the goal of offloading. And since contract is part of NetFilter, uh, it's easy to start integrating. The, the entry points, they are well uh, identified. They are well, the API is well contained. And again, no connections were offloaded on this presentation, but we actually integrated with TC. So how it was integrated with TC? Uh, we followed the approach that Mellanox has been proposing for the past conferences. There is a link in there for the paper that is really the base of the implementation that we did. Uh, we extended flood sector and flower classifier to match on contract information. So when you ask now Flower, hey, please match on contract state established. The float sector will be able to dereference the NFCT pointer on SKB and check for the state information and match based on that. And only if the pointer is already there. If it's not there yet, it's not going to fetch for you because a match is not supposed to alter any information, even it's data or metadata on the packet. And we also add a new action, it's called CT, should take contract actions on a packet, such as sending to a contract, which is how we get the initial information on, um, settings on information, uh, and marking for now. The CT action that we tested here uh, was rcu ified, which so we don't have any spin locks uh, because of this action. It should scale uh, quite well. And the patches that we use it, they are newer than the ones that we posted on the mailing list. 
SRFC. And we are working in collaboration with Mellanox for upstreaming them. So we should be able to post a new version quite soon, I would say like two weeks or so. So what we studied, the IP tables plus open vSwitch plus contract scenario, and then we compared with TC plus open vSwitch plus contract. Uh, we didn't rely on open vSwitch to do net because we didn't integrate it with open vSwitch yet. So we did that based on IP tables and then TC. This is a sample of the rule set that we used. The first one is supposed to drop some packets. So we have a bit more of uh, processing going on, like simulating other rules that would be matching. And it's also able to select the amount of flows that we are working with. It's just a standard drop. So the second one is the one that starts to match using contract information. It's matching on packets that they are not in tracked state. So if there is no information on contract on the packets, it's going to match this one. And then action CT is sending this packet to contract. And the next action go to chain 100, which is the proposal that uh, Balanox has been doing. And then on the chain 100, we match on CT state, which in this case with the new state and the tracking state. Okay, so that's a, that's a connection that we want to commit. We can actually confirm it in contract table and then take the action to output this packet on another port. This is just a sample. There were more rules on, on the testing, like for outputting the packet in the minus new state, but for uh, just to have an idea, these are enough. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna explain kind of the um, test setup a little bit. Um, so we, as Marcelo said, we used uh, IP tables and open vSwitch and um, uh, contract. And the, so sort of the problem with just going with straight OVS into a, into a VM and doing like a PVP test that way is there's not uh, an easy way to call into IP tables. Now, you might say like, oh, you could just call into the contractor from OVS and that's true, but the offload support for contract to actually like call the um, TC flower side isn't there. And rather than spend time like writing that, if things could change, you know, it just made more sense to um, create this kind of slightly more complicated topology where we push packets through this bridge and there we can run IP tables, go to the connection tracker, do some drops and uh, forward into guest and then uh, come back out. We use T-Rex as a packet generator. Um, we had some issues using the latest version, so uh, we did end up using like slightly older version. Um, I don't have any specific reason why uh, other than we ran into some bugs, so we had to use a slightly older version of T-Rex. Um, for the TC side, you'll notice there's some uh, red arrows those are like a, like a shunt. So we, when packets come in, uh, normally they would be passed, uh, for the IP tables testing, they would be passed from the NIC, uh, you know, through the bridge to OVS and then into the guest. But for us, we could actually just shunt, for, for the TC side, we did, uh, I decided to shunt them on the ingress side into the guest. And then the egress follows the, uh, the same path out uh, that, that IP tables follows. So. That's uh, kind of the setup. I know it looks a little funky, but yeah, that's, that's what we did. So this is the, some initial results for um, some latency measurements we took. Uh, this is from the IP tables testings. We call this like kind of the baseline. Um, so at each, um, at each like test that we did, we, we ran about we only did about 3,000 connections per second. Um, we could have done more, but that would require, again, some additional tuning and some additional like attempt to isolate like more the effects of what else is going on in the system. So I figure a low rate is easier to maybe see uh, that the system isn't loaded, so the effect of calling contract might be more obvious. Um, 
so we ran the test for about 100 seconds, and at each uh, you know, row there, we have like the percentage of traffic being dropped. So we kind of divided the traffic into like a few different subnets, um, and each subnet represented about 5% of the traffic. So then we could just like mask off a slash eight and drop it and you know, get like five, 10, 15, 20. Here we only did by 10, um, but yeah. Um, so these are the numbers. I guess they're just numbers, right? Uh, they don't ma mean much until we look at kind of um, the TC side uh, where we did, like I said, the same test. Um, this was, uh, again, uh, from the topology, packets come in, they get shunted directly to the VM, and then they, uh, you know, egress through OpenV switch and uh, the VETH and bridge and all back out to the NIC. So, and, and again, we collected the... Um, you know, kind of like the, the latency that it took, uh, or, or the, the latency through the system. Um, and here we kind of plot sort of what we think was the, um, you know, like a comparison, just to kind of see like where things are. And, and I don't quite understand uh, why the graph showed up the way it did, meaning uh, like that IP table slope is, a little strange and I didn't expect it, but um, TC kind of looks more closer to what I would expect, which is like as you drop packets, um, there's less calls into contract, and that means there would be like less latency imposed by kind of, uh, you know, the latency imposed on the packet by going to the connection tracker. So, yeah. Um, the, res the performance results here are like kind of interesting, but they're still very preliminary. I mean, like this was not done on a very optimized, like uh, optimally tuned system. So I didn't like tune the number of max connection tracker entries that could be there. I didn't like play with the timeouts to make sure that connections would expire really quickly to make sure there were no like other effects of lingering connections after they were torn down. Um, yeah, it was really like uh, very, very rough uh, numbers. And then um, one thing I forgot to mention is um, the test itself, the traffic is really just an HTTP request for 32K bytes and then the response. And so T-Rex would kind of partition it into the sending side and receiving side and play them out the correct ports. So we could see the, um, we could see kind of like what it would look like to have you know, simulated real traffic um, so for the future work on this TC side, like we want to better understand the performance. Um, we have some numbers doing like a more tuned setup where we run uh, like C100K and we're also working on, or I'm working on getting to like C1M. So that's, for, for anyone that doesn't know, that's 100,000 and 1 million connections. Um, we do need to add some integration to, um, for, for NAT actions, like uh, to actually perform the NAT transformation and um, on the packet as it passes through the, the data path. Um, one thing that, so actually, I really don't understand why this is the case, uh, but when OVS calls the CT action, it actually forks, it creates a copy of the packet and reruns it through the rules engine completely. Um, and, and it has some other side effects as well. For instance, on the current action chain, after the CT action, uh, the, the SK buff has its uh, CT information cleared, the action chain is completed, and then the uh, CT information is like re-added and it's processed. So it's, uh, there's a strange, uh, design there, and I, I don't know why it is that way, um, but that's something that we would need to, ha to be able to have OVS offload correctly, um, and I don't know why uh, it, it is that way. And then uh, the, f the final is uh, offloading hooks, but you added that, and I don't know what that means. Yeah, the, the offloading hooks would be the, the contract integration so that the entries 
can be actually offloaded to a card. And that's um, like one feet and a half uh, inside of loading already. But that would be needed. And in theory, it shouldn't interfere with CT action and the flower uh, classifier. But it's good to have uh, keep an, an eye on it. Okay, so now the second part is like a little bit more radical. Uh, and this is uh, something I've been looking at um, in parallel uh, along with Marcelo, which is actually integrating uh, the connection tracker with uh, kind of eBPF or XDP and enabling uh, like lookups or, or, you know, kind of informing the, the express data path about um, these connection tracking entries. And so you could kind of use it as like, in OVS, they have an exact match cache. You could, you could use it as like an exact tuple match that you could, do, you could make forwarding decisions on. And um, yeah, the approach I took initially was to add like this flow map, but that got knacked pretty quickly. Um, it, I was told, or, or rather the response was, it was a little too specialized. Uh, and they wanted something more generic. I don't quite know what that means. Um, but but I, uh, I took that into consideration and, and the approaches I'm looking at now are either adding perf events into the net filter uh, area or um, like using the flow table offload infrastructure and being able to attach like BPF program there. And then a uh, user could just like register for like either register for a perf event or uh, attach a BPF program, you know, get, get these uh, events as they come along and populate their own maps and uh, push it that way. Um, I still haven't figured out the best way of doing like any of this metadata sharing. So like the protocol information, like window offsets and uh, that kind of stuff that the core stack needs. Um, one of the challenges with like offloading connections this way is um, if there's an exception and a packet does have to go back through the host, uh, the host doesn't have any more accurate information about it. It's, it's been kind of offloaded. The, ho the host has been bypassed. And so we need to figure out a way to kind of like share that metadata. And that's not actually exclusive to this approach. It's al also in the, in the uh, TC path as well, but yeah. And, and that's actually it for uh, the presentation, so. so. We would like to know if, what do you think about integrating contract on other subsystems, like BPF, RTC? So do we have some of the Mellanox guys, like Ronnie and, where's Ronnie? You want to take a nap or something? Uh. Okay. I'm hard to speak, but I am here. We can hear you, go ahead. So, so as uh, they mentioned, we do working on it, and I think I presented it. I think it's all. It wasn't not only in the last native. I think it was another one before. Uh, but it's it's take time to do that. It's it's a complicated task. Um, I hope that we will have it shortly. I'm not running writing the code, so it's I can't help it uh, make it fast. Um, and there are challenges in TC and uh, the relationship with, con with contract that we're dealing in uh, to resolve. And we believe that it will help all our customer that's using OVS, that's using uh, an especially NAT because connection tracking by itself you can disable and, and spare it. But uh, for, for, for example, all the Kubernetes and all the time that's need uh, services, so you need actually uh, using a NAT for, for floating IP. So there is a requirement that we, uh, we need to support. Um, can you share a little bit about the details of the uh, uh, EPPF integration that you tried? Because um, um, there are other 
let's say, other use cases for accessing contract information from BPF that are not related specifically to hardware offload. Like, for example, being able to get information like this from an XT BPF program if that were available. So if you could share some uh, details on the approach that you actually tried. Yeah, sure. So um, it, it's on the mailing list. Uh, I posted it back in November, but uh, the basic idea was to extend the um, BPF subsystem to allow like some loadable module support. That was like kind of the, uh, I just kind of made a quick shunt so that um, we had a map that w you could load. When you loaded that map uh, and made uh, requests to the map for a specific key, like uh, which would be like a connection tuple, it would go to contract. It, it would go to this flow table that was set up and use the um, the NFT flow offload infrastructure or, or the the flow table infrastructure and kind of pull out uh, the the tuple information and the and the connection information. Okay, so it wasn't from from contract itself. It was from the from the flow table. It, it was from the flow table. Yeah. Okay. Any questions this side? So oh, when you're uh, trying to offload, right, is the plan to offload the rule after the connection is established? OK. So that means the software is going to maintain the state. The hardware is only uh, offloaded after the connection. So it may be, there may be a delay in adding the rule, right? So the packets may come into the slow path before the rule is actually added. So those type of issues need to be, this may cause the out of order packets, I guess. Yes, okay. yes, it would be, you'd get out of order packets. And then again, like I said, because, um, because the uh, packets are being actually processed all by the hardware, you lose the, um, the metadata that contract actually cares about, you know, or, or needs to make decisions when you have to take an exception. So for instance, if some packet you know, needs to follow that exceptional path and, and go back into software, it may have invalid like window number, you know, window information or something else. Sorry, is there anybody else? Or? Okay. So I, I will just explain a little bit what we're thinking about uh, doing. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, we, we don't want to mask, at least from the beginning, with the um, creation of TCP of, or for any other protocol. Uh, so we let the software decide where it's established and we want only to establish a value, only to offload established connections. Um, for, uh, for TCP, we are planning uh, also to uh, have in the hardware window validation. So then we will, can offload also the window validation, but also there, there was the problem, what you do if you have something that's the hardware can't process and you want to take it back to the software, we need to update the connection tracking, the software connection tracking with the latest window validation information. So these are the things that we will also will need to solve, but I think right now we want to, to have the first version that we start to offload uh, when the connection is established and only to let a uh, spocket for with a reset and fin to go back to the software in order to to terminate the TCP connection and of course to have uh, counters to do aging um, just to, the, to, to have an option to clean of course the table that it's won't overlo overloaded so how, how many how many flows can you offload then because you've got a lot of state going on there. Yes, yeah, so I think we already support uh, more than a million rules, a few million that's, rules. I know that's your magic number, Ronnie. So, there's so also, for of course, a rules can be a five-tuple match, so it's a connection. No, but yeah, but in this case, you're keeping track of TCP windows and everything that flies by, right? We are aiming the uh, same rough of number, millions. Okay. Um, any, someone else has a question? Be, behind you? Oh, beside me. Oh. Uh, uh, in all the pictures and uh, what we were uh, talking about, 
the connections always were from outside to some VM or something inside. Uh, is there any chance that this could work somehow in uh, case of classical gateway where the packets come to a different device from each side? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, so it, it would be usable in that case for sure. And that's, I think, one, well, like I don't know what small hardware does as far as like the ability to provide offloads or anything, but uh, it certainly could be used by like some small gateway device. Yeah, the, the problem is that when the packet in the opposite direction comes, you don't really know where to look for where, where was the connection established at that moment. Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Well, if you uh, establish a connection or entry, contract entry, uh, when a connection is created for, uh, say, SIM packet in one uh, direction, then when packets in the opposite direction come, that uh, at the time they arrive at some other device, you don't know what was the first device where the contract entry was established. I'd have to like see it drawn out. I, I don't know. Yeah, why don't you take that off for later? Uh, yeah. So we can take it offline, maybe. But uh, connection tracking is not only working by itself. So, for example, we're talking about connection tracking that is inside Open vSwitch, or here it will be offloaded to TC. So there is a pipeline. The, the connection tracking is not uh, something that is standing alone. It's have some inputs, the packet is coming from OVF, with rules from OVS or from TC that's specifying if it's come from this port, go to the contract and continue to another port. So those kind of things are done not in the contract itself, it coming from the rules that's in the table before, table after. So that's how it's going to be used with OVS, but I think uh, Two days ago, uh, Pablo mentioned that there is an also an IP, ta uh, IP table uh, caching that's doing approximately the same, and there he's also uh, keeping a kind of a hardware table that's uh, handle the incoming port and the outcoming port, and so maybe this is also something that can be used. Okay, can, so can, can you take this part for later, if we, you guys don't mind? So we'll give chance to other people. Sure. Yes, so my remark is basically uh, um, we should consider the edge cases where this might conflict with the existing stack behavior because if you have TC rules that perform CT actions, then it changes from, from NetFilter's point of view, it changes behavior because now if a packet comes up into a stack, and uh, for instance, to the raw table, it will now see that there is a contract attached to the packet which would currently only ever happen for loopback traffic. So we should be careful to not add uh, anything that breaks existing ex assumptions in the stack. And if necessary, we might have to consider adding additional tracking information to the, to the entry if, if, if this was created by the contract action or by the NetFilter stack itself. If that comes to pass, then I think we can probably do it. So I don't see any fundamental reasons why we can't uh, do this integration work. Anybody else? So I have a question. So you, one of you, I think I may be imagining this, but I think you said that you had a problem with TC not being able to to do, to defy a drop to later on because somebody may undrop in a pipeline. Or did you say something like this in one of your slides? I think where open I think OVS has this rule which seems to be built based on hardware pipeline uh, point of view. So packet can be, when we say drop, later on you can decide that you want to undrop. Okay, maybe I'm just imagining. Nope. All right. Uh, one more question. Anybody? No? Well, thank you. <laughs>